love Jesus in this place this morning? Oh, we lift our voices to you, Jesus. We give you the praise. We give you the honor. We welcome you into our hearts, into our lives, into our presence today to give us hope and to assure us that you've got this. And so we come to you, each person in this room, Lord, whatever it is that is on our heart, on our mind, knowing that the strong name of Jesus this morning is going to be powerful in this place, in our lives. And Lord Jesus, would you be lifted up and glorified here today? We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. You can have a seat. You got to hear the proverb that we're going to talk about today. Proverb 18.10 says this, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs to it and is safe. I am loving Proverbs 18. This is not the only proverb in Proverbs 18 that is awesome. If you haven't been digging into Proverbs 18, you got to check out Proverbs 18. There is so much in it that we're never going to get to touch. Look at it this week. But this proverb is awesome. Stop for just a moment. This place is full this morning. Would you give a shout out in this room for everyone watching online this morning? Would you say hello to them? We love you. And for all those of you out on the um, porch watching in on, on, onto this service, um, I, I want you to give a shout out for the people. Let's see if we can hear them. Come on on the porch. Let's hear you on the inside. Let's hear you shout. Yes, we hear you, right? I guess. Hey, everyone in here, give it a shout out for the people on the porch. Um, we're filling up in this room pretty soon. We're going to have to go to a second service, so we're excited about that. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for serving. Thank you for being just dialed in to doing what God's calling you to do in your life, serving other people, caring for people, loving people, getting together in groups during the week. We love that, and we're excited about that. Now back to the text. Again, Proverbs 18.10 meditate on this, get to know it. The words of this, the, this verse will absolutely help you through the time that we're in right now. There could be not a more pertinent proverb for the day that we're in this week and even the week we've been through. Anyone have power missing this week? I mean, a crazy week of um, insecurity and and yet, let me read this verse again because it's the verse that will help us so much. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. So listen to these words. Nothing makes us feel more insecure or unsettled than when we sense that we cannot protect ourselves or our loved ones. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. One of the strongest emotions that we ever feel is the emotion of fear. And what one of the greatest longings that we have is that longing to feel safe. And we read these words again. The name of the is a strong tower. Strong tower was a, a fortified place in ancient times that when military action was taking place and you found yourself fearful, they could run into that strong tower, that fortified place, and be safe. If you're feeling that strongest emotion of fear, if the world around you is shaking, you run to the name of the Lord who is that strong tower. That name of the Lord was so strong that those who would speak it would not even utter those words. It is a holy name. It is the name that is powerful. So powerful that when we come to him and we invoke his name and his strength, in that name, all of everything we need is included and we can come to him. The names of God written in scripture cover all of the issues of our human existence and the needs that we have. One of our elders was talking yesterday in one of our elder meetings, and we were, we were having a conversation about this very thing, and we were talking about this verse, and he said, you know, 
in the Ten Commandments, it says not to take the Lord's name in vain. And when we normally talk about taking the Lord's name in vain, he indicated, you know, that's this negative thing. Don't, don't use it as a curse word. But he said, if you, if you flip that upside down and begin to talk about it from a point of view, is that any time that we don't use the name of God for the power that is found in it for our life, we are wrong. So it begins to remind us that the name of the Lord is so powerful that to just use it as a throwaway phrase is absolutely unacceptable because it is at the name of Jesus that every knee will bow, that every tongue will confess. It is in the name of Jesus that we see healing taking place. It's at the name of Jesus that Satan flees and can't stand being around. In the name of Jesus, there is power. We read that when Jesus was given his name by the angel in the New Testament Bible, the name of Jesus means God with us. So when we are feeling fearful, when we are feeling separated, when we are feeling scared, we call on the name of Jesus, God with us, the one who wants to be with us and come into our lives and be part of our lives. We find throughout Scripture when God's people call on the name of God, that holy name of God, that powerful name of God, amazing things happen. We see in the Old Testament, whole armies flee, cities fall. You move to the New Testament, you see a Paul and Silas sitting in jail, and they begin to sing, and they begin to worship. And you know what happens? <laughs> An earthquake hits, and the chains fall off. And, and the jailer is saved and his entire family, and God begins to move in powerful ways. I come to you this morning on a, a morning that is exciting. It's marking in our church's history where we have the privilege of having a, a new worship leader begin this morning, David Virgo. So glad to have you in the house this morning. He moved in like 12 hours before all the power went off in, in Pennsylvania. And um, I'm waiting in line, you know, all the way up 100, trying to get into the gas station. And I'm thinking, oh, no, Virgo. I mean, he just moved in. He probably doesn't have food. He probably doesn't have electricity. He's probably sitting there cowering in the corner of his apartment, scared to death. And so I text him. I'm like, dude, because I'm, I'm, like, I'm on Route 100 with 400 other cars in front of me. And I'm hoping the gas station doesn't run out of gas before I get gas for my generator. And, and so I text David. I'm like, David, you okay? You got, you got power? You got food, man? And he texts back, yeah, no, I haven't been to the grocery store yet. I'm like, no, this is not what I wanted to hear tonight. He goes, yeah, I'm sitting. Where, where, where were you? Out back or something like that? Yeah, having dinner. You know, I'm like, oh, you know, the guy's better off than I am. He says, I have power. I live in an apartment in a prime location. They give him power no matter what. And he was fine. But we're so thankful to have David in the house this morning and have him leading us. But here's the thing. We don't ask David to come lead us so that we can have cool music or so that we have a great entertainment on a Sunday morning. We have David come and lead us because this scripture tells us that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. He picked the songs that we sang this morning long before um, we, we were preparing for today. Here's why. Because a worship leader who loves Jesus knows that the name of Jesus is powerful. A great worship leader knows that when we come together and we lift up the name of Jesus, Jesus, there is power in that name, and there is power in a place of people that have come after a week of some crazy things going on in their life, and it was way more than power. If power is the biggest thing that we've got going on, we're a blessed people, and yet, I don't know about you, but for a lot of us, that put us really close to the precipice, right? <laughs> no, cable no cable TV. Sorry about that. No, praise God. That would make our world better real fast, wouldn't it? Anyhow, here's the bottom line, is he comes into this place today to help us come together as a people, to come into the strong tower, that place of protection, with the one thing, the name of the Lord. And as we come in here today with the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, there is power in that, there is protection in that, there is safety in that, there are answers in that. And as we lift up the name of Jesus, 
all of what the enemy tries to throw at us all week long in this messed up world that we live in, all of that flees because Satan cannot stand the praise of God, cannot stand the name of Jesus because he knows how the book ends and Jesus wins. And so when we come in here, we put the enemy on notice. It's over, and we believe that. And you're not going to take us down, and you're not going to put us in a pit, and you're not going to discourage us, and we are not going to be set aside. We are children of the King of Kings, Lord of Wars. We are the chosen ones of God. He looks at us and he says, I love you, I love you, I love you. And we come here this morning to lift up the praises of the name of Jesus. The Old Testament of our Bible, one of the things I love, and I've mentioned this to you many, many times, are the stories of the Bible that begin to show us how things have worked in the past and to help us see how God might be able to work in our lives. Because when we're in the middle of it, you just can't see it. When you look at someone else, you go, yeah, of course. Of course it was that way. But we get to see a little picture of how God works. So there's a king in the Old Testament. His name was Jehoshaphat. He was a king of Judah. And as he reigned, he was an excellent king. In fact, first Chron- Second Chronicles chapter 17-ish begins to explain about Jehoshaphat. You get a chance, look into these verses and chapter um, 17 through about 21 of Second Chronicles tells us about Jehoshaphat. He comes in and he begins to lead the people to say, hey, we need to follow God. We need to trust God. And in those days, God's people would sort of swing back and forth and come back to God when things got tough, and then they'd swing away from him. And in this time, and it happened over and over, the people had really leaned towards following after um, false gods. They had followed after idols, this kind of thing. And Jehoshaphat came in, and he tore down those altars to the false gods and began to clean up the mess. But like each one of us, even when we are doing well, There are temptations, so many temptations out there, and so many things that lead us astray. He creates a marriage alliance, and in that time, they would would, um, marry someone and create this alliance in order to create this alliance with another king to create safety. So he makes an alliance with a very godless king by the name of Ahab, who was over Israel, and Ahab's the guy who is married to Jezebel. Does that ring any bells with you? And that begins to explain some things to you real fast. And it, shortly after they make this marriage alliance, and for the whole sole purpose of safety for our people, this type of thing, even though that would, God would have never had him come together with an ungodly king, um, this ungodly king says, hey, listen, we need to go to war together, and we need, to, we need to go to battle, and we can do this together, and we can make this happen. And, and the response of Jehoshaphat right from the beginning is, hey, we ought to check with God on this. This is the kind of mind he had, this kind of mindset that he has. And so King Ahab says, oh, no problem. I have 400 prophets that can come and talk to us about this. And so these 400 prophets, they come and they tell them, oh, it's great, You're, God's gonna let you win and everything's gonna be great and your life's gonna be good and the two of you are gonna be forever buds and all this kind of stuff. And they're all nodding and Ahab's going, see what I told you? And then um, King Jehoshaphat, there's something inside of him that's not settled. Well, I'll tell you what's not settled is who these prophets are. These 400 prophets are actually on King Ahab's um, payroll. These are the 400 prophets. Not necess- they are not prophets of God. In fact, they were part of um, a cult or goddess called Asherah. This is the moon god. Um, she was the chief female deity um, in Phoenicia. They called her Astart- Astarte. And the Assyrians called her Ishtar. And she was um, the goddess who they would worship through prostitution and all sorts of stuff like that. And these were the 400 prophets that were involved in that. Jehoshaphat says, hey, let's talk to a guy by the name of Micaiah. By the way, a lot of years ago I got ordained and this, there was a question in my ordination council, who was the 401st prophet? 
I had no idea. I didn't know who the 400th prophet was. How would I know who the 401st prophet was? And I was sort of irritated. Like, are, are, am I supposed to know that kind of granular information? Well, if I had known this passage, I would have known who the 401st prophet was because there were 400 prophets of um, Astarte, of um, Asher, who were prophesying, yeah, go do it. It's all good. And then this guy by the name of Micaiah, he's the 401st prophet who Jehoshaphat says, bring him in. And King Ahab says, no, thank you. This guy never says anything good. He doesn't want to do what I want to do, and he always prophesies bad against me. No, I don't want him. Jehoshaphat says, bring him anyhow. And so Micaiah comes in and um, begins to prophesy on, on this situation. And when Micaiah speaks, this awesome little text in um, 2 Chronicles chapter 18, Micaiah says, here's the deal. I will only speak that which is from God. I'm only going to bring you God's word, and whatever God is saying, that's what I'm going to speak back. The problem we have in our world right now is there's 400 people, 400 prophets, 400 voices saying, here's what has to be said, and here's how it has to be said. And everyone's going, oh, yes, okay, we'll all say that. And when there is one where God says, listen, here's what I want said. Here's what I want preached from my pulpits. Here's my message to you. Here's my message to you, Jehoshaphat and Ahab. And this King, Maca um, um, King um, or prophet Micaiah, he looks at King Ahab and Jehoshaphat and says, you go to war, you're going to lose this war. And in the midst of this, Ahab's going to be, going to be killed. And Ahab's, ah, no truth to that. And Micaiah says, hmm, go do it then, see, see what happens. And so you'll have to read the story because it's just fascinating how it works out. Ahab sets it up so that there's no way he can get killed and that Jehoshaphat gets killed instead. In the midst of the battle, they, sure enough, they start coming after Jehoshaphat. And in that moment, Jehoshaphat cries out to the Lord. And you got to understand, in this whole process, Jehoshaphat while he starts out right, while he even asks for the right thing that God's will in this, he ends up falling back and compromising and saying, okay, yeah, there's 400 people. I guess we'll go to the, goes towards that and not the one, but he knows better. But in that moment where he's made his mistake, you and I have been there. We've been there many times. Um, he knows what to do, and he calls out to the Lord. Lord protects him, and it, it appears that almost like this random shot goes out after Ahab, and he dies in, in that moment. They come back um, from, from that war, and um, they're, they're in a very um, different situation. Uh, Jehoshaphat makes reforms. He goes, here's what we're going to do, country. We are going to bow down. We are going to repent of our sins. We are going to fast. We are going to put God first. I don't like what happened in me. I didn't like what I just saw in me. We're going to turn things around. This is not going to be our trajectory going forward. And as is always the case, there is a there is a round two where, where you're challenged again, where you have this sense where you can end up back in the exact same spot. And this time, it's even worse than the first challenge. And he hears, Jehoshaphat hears, that there is an army. In fact, the, in chapter 20 of Second Chronicles, it says, a great multitude coming from Eden, and they're coming from beyond the sea. And, and it says, then Jehoshaphat was afraid. The greatest emotion that we feel is that of fear. The greatest desire we have is safety. This man is fearful. Last time he turns to a godless king. Last time he listens to 400 prophets, ignores the one. But this time, in the midst of being afraid, the very same sentence in chapter 20 of Second Chronicles, verse 3, it says, He set his face to seek the Lord. The proverb that we're focusing in on today, the name of the is a strong tower. He gets it this time. It has to be drilled into our head. We have to be reminded because all the alliances we can make, all the 400 people that we can go to and talk to won't get it. There is one name. There is one strong name. It is the name of Yahweh God who is our strong tower, our fortress to run into when all of a sudden fear wells up within us. And when fear fell up within us, that's what he did. He proclaims a fast throughout all Judah 
and he calls the people, and he says, I want you all to come together, and let's seek the Lord. By the way, that's what happens when, when things are getting tough. God's people come together. And that's why we continue to assemble every weekend. It's why we continue to come together, because we need this time where we can come and fall before God, where we can be reminded and as a group shout out our praises to God and refocus our attention on our strong tower, on the name of the Lord, because everything else around us is telling us to handle this in different ways. His prayer is Amazing. Here's what he says when he prays in front of the people. He says, for we are powerless against this great horde that is coming against us. We do not do, we do not know what to do. And listen to this, but our eyes are on you. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower. I don't know what to do. You don't know what to do. You're trying to figure out some things in your life. You're fearful. But our eyes are on you. Lord, in the midst of my fear, you're my strong tower. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 says this. Though we live in the world, we are not carrying on a worldly war. For the weapons of our warfare are not worldly, listen to this, but have divine power. The name of the Lord. The name of Yahweh, the holy name of God. Cry out, call upon his name, call on the name of Jesus, the name above all names, the name by which we must be saved. There is no other name under heaven by which we can be saved except the name of Jesus. And if we're turning anywhere else, we're turning the wrong way and it's going to end up badly. And maybe you've been there, but you come and you get this second chance just like Jehoshaphat did. And in that moment, you say, God, we don't know what to do. We're fearful. We're we're only calling. We're bowing before you. We're not going to come to you with the normal ways everyone else handles it. We are going to try Trust in you for your powerful name to make a difference. And listen to what the Lord says back through his prophet. He says this, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed at this great army coming after you. For the battle is not yours, but God's. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The battle is not yours. It's God's. See, originally, I'll go make a marriage alliance. Originally, um, we'll go talk to 400 people. Originally, we can make battle plans, and we can go in there, and, and, and we can play the chess game, but the battle is not yours. The weapons of our warfare are not worldly. They're not those things. The weapons of our, world, our, our, our warfare are spiritual. That's why you come in here this morning. That's why we shout out. That's why we sing the name of Jesus David talked to the worship team just before he came out here. He says, listen, when we go into worship, we're going into a place where we're we're, we're delivering hope. We're delivering the word of God. We're bringing truth. We're bringing the name of Jesus to this group of people. When we step into worship, David, we're stepping into warfare, and we're bringing the name of Jesus to bear in this place. It's not just, hey, that's a cool thing we do before we sing or before we preach and so we can hear something. No, it's all a big piece of it. It's a part of it. That's why we bring you songs that are scripturally based. That's why we bring you songs that are all based about Jesus, because at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. And we read here, he says, do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Tomorrow, go, up, um, go out there, and the Lord will be with you. Then Jehoshaphat bowed his head, his face to the ground, and all Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. Is that not exactly what we need to do? And so whether you're sitting in this room and and you're part of what we're doing in this room, whether you're out on the porch watching it on the screen, um, or whether you're sitting in your living room, there is something powerful about worshiping the Lord. When we're in the midst of this fear, we realize we get reoriented. We get our head back on our shoulders again. We get our heart right with God, and we begin to just worship him. And it says this, they rose early in the morning. They went out to the wilderness of Tekoa, And Jehoshaphat stood and he said, Hear me, Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem. 
Believe in the Lord your God, and you'll be established. Believe his prophets, and you will succeed. Believe God. Believe his word. And then he says this. And when he took counsel with the people, he appointed those who were to sing to the Lord and to praise him in his holy attire as they went before the army to say, worship to me, come up here, because this is, this is what he says here to do. He says, I'm get, get the people together. Let's get ready to sing. This isn't just a nice ending. This isn't just something to pump you up, leave you feeling good. And listen to this, verse 22. And when they, be, don't, don't, don't worry about them. They, let, hear these words. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord set an ambush among the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. And, and it tells us they were all destroyed by destroying one another. Israel didn't even have to fight that day. They fought their battles in spiritual ways. They came before God. They began to sing. It was such a huge rout that four days later after they had cleaned up after it, it says they assembled and there they blessed the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. They knew the name of the Lord was the thing that won the day. Bringing the name of Jesus to bear in this moment is what's going to win the day. It's going to be what overcomes your fears and your insecurities. It's what's going to, at the end of the verse of um, Proverbs 18, the righteous runs into it and is safe. When your kid is fearful, what do you do? Go, go outside and play. Um, you, you, you figure it out. Go to your room. No, you say, come here. Crawl up on my lap. And you put him on your lap. The one who runs into the name of the Lord, into his safe tower, is a safe person. And verse 28 says, they came to Jerusalem with harps and lyres and trumpets to the house of God. And the fear of God came on all of the kingdoms and the countries when they heard that of the Lord had fought against the enemies of the Israelites. So the realm of Jehoshaphat was quiet, for God gave rest all around. I love the words of Psalm 122, uh, verse 1. I was glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower, a strong house. The righteous man runs into it and is safe. David, we're calling you here to lead us to that strong name of Jesus Christ who has won the victory, and we're here to be reminded of that. Man, take us into that song a minute. Stand up, join us in this church. Let's lift up the name of Jesus in this place one more time.